The only unsolved murder of a South Australian police officer is the murder of Constable William Hyde, left dying from a gunshot wound at Marriottville on the hot summer's night of January the 2nd, 1909. William Hyde had been born in South Australia on the 21st of September 1872 in Allendale East in the extreme southeast corner of the colony. Hyde, who was 5 foot 11, worked as an agricultural labourer before joining the police on the 1st of May 1902. He joined the Marriottville station on the 29th of April 1903. Eerily, the officer he replaced was Constable Albert Ring, who was being transferred to Glenelg. Ring was shot dead by a drunken fisherman in Jetty Road on the 29th of March 1908. His killer fled to undeveloped land around the Sturt River and hid for a few days. When he gave himself up, the officer who took him in a horse and trap to the station was Constable Hyde. On April the 5th, 1905, when his wife became worried that she could not find 46-year-old Constable Rear, a 25-year veteran of the police, it was Hyde who discovered his colleague dead in one of the cells at Marriottville Station. Rhea had written a letter of resignation to the Commissioner, effective from 12am on the 6th of April, and then shot himself in the chest with his revolver. Marriottville Police Station was on the southern side of Kensington Road, just a short distance from the corner of Eastry Street, now called Tusmore Road. Hyde lodged at a property near Eastry Street, and was well known and liked in the community, described as a courteous man. Like Constable Ring, he preferred to resolve issues without needing to resort to his police powers. It was said he would sooner escort a drunkard safely home than lock them up. He was known to counsel young men straying towards criminal ways, rather than arrest them for minor matters, although he was also said to be severe when the situation required. The 2nd of January 1909 was a hot and sultry summer's day in Adelaide the temperature peaking at 112.1 degrees Fahrenheit. As it was a Saturday, Hyde, who was a keen cricketer, was playing for his club that afternoon. He scored 57 to top score for his side. Around 6pm that evening, dust clouds blew over the city before the winds died down and the night became hot and unsettled. At about 9.30pm, Hyde was walking down Shipsters Road on the Kensington side of Kensington Road. At the corner stands the Marriottville Hotel. Behind the hotel in Shipsters Road were some large peppercorn trees, and beyond them was a branch office of the Municipal Tramways Trust at the terminus of the Kensington tram line. As Hyde passed by the tree, he observed three men lurking in the shadows. It was still hot despite the late hour, the temperature being 87 degrees Fahrenheit at 9pm. Yet the trio, who remained hidden in the dark, wore caps and black Chesterfield overcoats with velvet collars. Hyde had been a policeman long enough to suspect their motives at once. The men stayed still and silent as the constable walked by. Earlier two children, a brother and sister who had gone to buy ice creams, had dropped some pennies on the ground. They asked a man leaning against the, a post wearing an overcoat for a light and he struck a match which enabled them to find the money they had dropped. Both youngsters thought it strange that the man was wearing such a coat. The wife of the hotel's licensee, Mrs Perches, addressed Hyde as he reached the hotel, inquiring if he had seen the men, whom she too had misgivings about. She and her daughter had gone to the tramway office next door just before Hyde appeared to get five shillings worth of copper coins. She noticed that two of the men kept their faces to the wall as if wishing to hide them, although the third man said good evening to the pair. The landlady remarked to her daughter about how odd it was for them to be dressed in overcoats on such a hot night. Yes, I have got my eye on them. I want to look at their faces, Hyde told her. As they spoke, the three men emerged from the shadows of the trees and walked past the hotel and crossed Kensington Road to stand on a street corner almost opposite the hotel. Due to the warmth, many people were outside, and the men were overheard apparently arguing among themselves, using strong language. 
Two of the men were overheard to say to the third man that he had come too late. In a short while, the three began walking eastwards on Kensington Road and turned down Eastry Street. At this point, Constable Hyde took his leave of Mrs. Purchase and also walked towards Eastry Street. Hyde co-owned a pony which was adjusted in Jones Paddock in Eastry Street. Earlier in the day, the equine had hurt itself on a fence wire and Hyde had told the co-owner, Charles Correll, who owned the local ham shop, that he would check on the animal later. He may have intended to do so, while at the same time keeping a watch on the strangers, or he may have decided to speak to the men to ascertain who they were and what they were doing. Although there were two revolvers at the police station for use by the officers, Hyde was unarmed this night. Adelaide had experienced a spate of burglaries in the latter months of 1908. Most of the incidents were probably the work of one gang. At about 12.50am in the early hours of October the 16th, 1908, in Weymouth Street, Adelaide, the office of biscuit manufacturers Motterham and Williamson's was raided. The door jemmied open and a small safe used to hold money moved just outside of the office and dynamited. The door of the safe was blasted into shrapnel. The doorknob was found embedded in the ceiling. This was being carried out during a heavy rainstorm. The local residents who heard the rumble thought it was thunder. The haul amounted to about fifteen pounds. A bricklayer, James McNally, who lived opposite the factory, looked outside and saw four men leaving the building. One hurried away, but the other three kept their heads down and strolled nonchalantly towards West Terrace, where the firm's discarded cash box was later retrieved. About a month later, a stash of explosives were found by workmen, concealed in a secluded area of the Botanic Gardens. While this was a setback for the thieves, they soon procured more supplies. Forty detonators and a quantity of fuse were stolen from Dinon's Quarry at Mitcham in late November. Soon after, Shawnee's ironmongers at Port Adelaide had its window smashed and five revolvers stolen. At 4am on the 22nd of December 1908, a safe at the Alberton Railway Station had its door blown off the hinges and three pounds ten shillings and some keys were taken. Nothing else in the office was disturbed. With this in mind, Hyde was no doubt very anxious to know what the mystery men were doing. Others had noticed the men and it was believed they had come to rob the tramway office of its Saturday night takings. Those working at the office believed so. One of the men had entered the office and changed a half sovereign into four half crowns. As he did so, he took careful note of the layout of the room. Having seen the men, it was decided that one of the stable grooms would be entrusted with 88 pounds to convey to the city. The thought being the would-be thieves would not think the man would be one to carry the cash. Nobody is certain how the affray began, but there were witnesses to most of the incident. Mrs. Alice Schutz was walking home to Stattenborough Street, accompanied by her husband's cousin, Miss Schutz. As the ladies turned the corner into Eastry Street, they saw four men run across the road and double back before two of them fell to the ground. At first they believed it was just a group of men having some New Year's fun. Then the sound of four or five revolver shots rang out. A cyclist had stopped in the middle of the street and watched the events unfold. Mrs. Schutz asked if he could intervene, but the man remained silent and motionless, as if stunned, before mounting his bicycle and riding away. Horace Fordham, a 17-year-old who lived in Eastry Street, witnessed the struggle as well. He saw the two men initially running away, leaving the third being tackled by Hyde. Then he heard one of the men say, He's all right, he's on his own, before five gunshots rang out. Three went wide, but it was re later realised one had grazed Hyde's shoulder, and the final one hit Hyde in the face. Mr and Mrs Matchos were sitting outside their home when they saw the flash from the revolver. One of the bullets fired at Hyde narrowly missed striking Mrs Matchos. Mrs Pittman, who resided next door to Hyde and was standing at her gate facing Eastry Street, and a dentist named Laws, who had been walking behind the three men, also witnessed the fracas. 
Laws and Mrs. Pittman's husband were among those who ran to offer assistance to Constable Hyde as he lay on the road. One of the men had taken up a position at the fence line behind Cooper's brewery and placed his revolver on a fence post to steady it as he aimed at Constable Hyde as he struggled with the other man. The witnesses saw the flash and heard the report of the gun, the shooter remarking, Take that, you bastard! The three men then ran across the paddock at the rear of the brewery, leaving the wounded Constable Hyde in the gutter. Mrs. Schutz, who was a trained nurse, went to see if she could provide any assistance, and was dismayed to discover the identity of the victim. She and Hyde were lifelong friends. Alice Schutz had lived in Port Macdonnell, a town only four miles away from Allendale East. She had only left the area when she married, months earlier. Hyde was bleeding profusely from a wound in his right cheek, and had lost consciousness. Her cousin ran to apprise Mr. Schutz of what had happened. Horace Fordham took off his coat and rolled it up to form a pillow, placed underneath Hyde's head. Iced water was brought from Correll's shop on Kensington Road. As Mrs. Schutz bathed his face with the cool water, Hyde came to, but was confused. "'What are you doing, Al?' he asked. "'What has happened? What's all that blood on your skirt?' Although he seemed to recognise familiar faces around him, he was confused about what had happened, and kept asking about it. Hyde also said he felt drowsy. Meanwhile, a few hundred yards away, the fleeing men reached a fence on the boundary of the property owned by a man named Claude Shuttleworth. Mr. Shuttleworth and his son Leonard had been sitting in their garden and heard the shots. The older man saw the trio running hard in the moonlight. "'Here they are, coming across the paddock,' remarked his son. They scaled the picket fence and dropped into Shuttleworth's yard. Leonard moved to intercept them and asked them what had happened. Presumably the same man who had shot Constable Hyde snarled, "'I'll stop you, you bastard,' and fired at Leonard. The bullet went wide and ended embedded in the roof of their house, but it was enough to cause Leonard to back off, and the men continued their flight through the Shuttleworth's orchard, becoming entangled in wire netting that separated the garden from the orchard, before breaking through a boxthorn hedge onto Stattenborough Street. Here they were lost to sight as they continued running in the direction of Burnside. An Aboriginal police tracker named Mick was on the site early the following morning, about 5am, and deduced that two of the men had continued running up Stattenborough Street towards the Adelaide Hills, while the third man had run across the road, and using a stack of planks had jumped into another private property, before turning back towards Eastry Street. Mick was unable to follow either set of tracks any further as a heavy shower of rain had fallen in the middle of the night and obscured them. Constable Wilhelm Dranken, a man nicknamed the Prince of Wales, due to his striking resemblance to Britain's King Edward VII, was in charge of the Marriottville station, and had been on duty in Bishop's Place in nearby Kensington, when he heard the sound of the gunshots, and had immediately made his way back to the station. Almost as soon as he arrived, a messenger came in to impart the news of Hyde's shooting. Drenken phoned for medical assistance, and then rushed down to Eastry Street. Drenken had obtained a board, or shutter, from the local baker, Mr Lynn, whose premises adjoined the paddock, and used it as a stretcher to ferry Hyde back to the police station. Hyde was breathing heavily and groaning. He complained that his jaw ached. At the station, three local doctors attended the stricken officer. From the station, an ambulance took Hyde to the Adelaide Hospital, accompanied by Alice and Hugo Schutz. By now, Hyde had lapsed back into insensibility. Drenken informed the city watch house of the events. Officers were coming off duty after eight-hour shifts, but when they heard what had occurred, at least 24 officers made their way to Marriottville and began spreading out to search the countryside and quarries for any sign of the assailants. Despite staying until noon Sunday, they failed to apprehend any of the men. The first man the police were searching for was described as aged between 25 and 30, 5 foot 8 or 5 foot 9, dark complexion and a dark clipped moustache. The second man was also 25 to 30 and 5 foot 8 or 5 foot 9, but of fair complexion, 
with a longer, lighter-coloured moustache. The third man was said to be 27 years of age, six foot tall with a ruddy complexion, strong build and wearing a low-cut vest. The hotelier's wife possibly provided these descriptions, as both she and a young girl named Dorothy Jones are said to have seen the same men in the area during the afternoon, looking into shop windows. A letter writer calling themselves Friend of the Police sent a letter to the advertiser newspaper a few days later, complaining that when the police had arrived, they were uncertain about where they should be searching. The letter writer believed that they should have positioned themselves between Adelaide and the eastern suburbs, as the popular opinion was that the men had doubled back there. The next morning the scene of the shooting was examined by light of day. The ground was heavily bloodstained where Hyde had lain. In the paddock where the pony was quartered, a fully loaded six-chambered revolver and a felt cap were found. One of the men had attempted to use the weapon, but it had misfired. In the paddock through which the men fled were found two discarded overcoats. With the coats were found a bloodstained cap, a green baize mask, and a scarf in the red and blue of the Norwood football team colours. A third overcoat found some distance away beyond Burnside was handed into police on suspicion that it may have belonged to one of the culprits. At hospital on Sunday, an operation to extract the bullet failed when the projectile could not be located. It was discovered the base of Hyde's skull was fractured, and paralysis was noted to be setting in on one side of Hyde's body. Hyde's mother hastened to Adelaide and was by her son's side when he died at 11pm on the 4th of January. At the post-mortem, the fatal bullet was located in the base of his brain. Constable Hyde's funeral took place on Wednesday 6th of January. The funeral cortege left from his brother's home in Power Street, travelling down Halifax Street to Hurtle Square. From there it took Carrington and Wright Streets to arrive at the West Terrace Cemetery. It was estimated that 10,000 people lined the route, with 6,000 crowding the cemetery to attend the burial service. The population of the entire state was then about 409,000. Two of the pallbearers were constables, who had been boys with Hyde in his hometown. Following Hyde's death, the state government posted a reward of £250 for information in the case, which was increased to £500 on the 4th of February. There were suspicions and some arrests made. One man who resembled the description of one of the offenders wrote to the newspapers to gripe that he was subject to many suspicious glances. A pair of young men, Percy Mackay and William Robertson, were charged with theft of jewellery at Randwick in Sydney on the 22nd of February 1909. Robertson, alias King, had come from Adelaide, and it was announced in the Sydney press that they may have had some involvement in the murder. Adelaide police reviewed the evidence and found it so meagre that they said without further evidence there would be no proceedings against the pair. However, the greatest suspicion fell upon a group of men suspected to be behind the office robberies and safe crackings. Two of these were arrested on the 23rd of January at 2am in Pulteney Street near St Paul's Church. Police in Wakefield Street had seen them hurrying across the road and decided to question them. The men said they were just out for a walk around. Harry Mason and Ernest Ryan were both young. Mason had a clean record, but he also had a loaded revolver on him when arrested. Furthermore, his father had complained to the police about his son's behaviour. Mason had boasted that he had a gun and would shoot any policeman who came to his father's house to interfere with him. When asked why he was carrying a loaded gun, he replied that he had found it in the parklands. On the 26th of January, another revolver was found in the St Paul's churchyard, presumably one Ryan had been toting. Ryan, alias Jeffries, alias Moran, was only 22, but had already been whipped at age 15 for larceny, absconded from the McGill Reformatory, and served time in Fremantle Jail in Western Australia in 1905 for a burglary where a constable was threatened with a gun. Ryan was unlikely to have been involved in the shooting of Hyde, as at only five foot four, he was much shorter than witness descriptions of the trio. Two other men were arrested in February 
on charges of vagrancy. George Pascoe, alias Palmer, and James Henry Townley were alleged to be involved in the burglary gang with Ryan and Mason, as well as men named as Bennett and Professor Goldman. Nothing was ever proven in relation to the killing of Constable Hyde. Ryan and Townley would both go on to have long criminal careers. A man named Sean O'Reardon, while in jail in Western Australia, confessed to multiple crimes, including the murder of Hyde. But again, there was no evidence with which to bring a criminal charge. In late February, Constable Hyde's mother was granted £500 compensation by the state government. In mid-April, police from the Metropolitan and Port Adelaide divisions showed their gratitude to those who had given comfort to the dying constable. Alice Schutz was given a tea and coffee service on a silver-mounted Australian oak tray, and Horace Fordham was given an inscribed gold medal. Although Inspector Raymond, in presenting the medal to Horace's father, wished that the young man would long wear his medal, it was not to be so. Horace Fordham enlisted in the Australian Army's 10th Battalion on the 19th of August 1914. He died in Egypt of smallpox on the 11th of February 1915, having just turned 24. Months passed and the crime grew cold. On the 4th of August 1909, an oak tree was planted close to the spot where Hyde was shot, with a metal guard around it bearing a shield which read, This tree was planted in memory of Constable William Hyde, who was shot here by highwaymen, 2nd of January 1909. In December 1951, it was reported that the tree died and was replaced by another in 1911. That tree, and the one which followed it, also died. Finally, the fourth tree planted in memoriam died in 1951, despite the trees being given proper care. The street was, and still is, lined with trees. It was therefore decided that Hyde would be remembered instead with a drinking fountain, to which the shield would be attached. The fountain was 50 feet away from the site of the incident. This remained in place until 1980, when a supermarket redevelopment caused it to be removed. The fountain vanished at this time, although it was supposed to have been repositioned on the opposite side of Tusmore Road, the former Eastry Street. Marriottville Primary School once occupied this site, now known as the Constable Hyde Memorial Garden. A new oak tree was planted and flourishes in the new garden. A plaque dedicated in 1981 continues to remind those who pass by of the evening long ago when Constable Hyde was murdered by three nameless assassins who escaped into the shadows of night and into the dark corners of history. <laughs>